Hello, I'm Kim Freeman and welcome to St. David's Bible Study. Greetings to the roomies and the zoomies and the YouTubies. And if you're watching online for the first time, we'd love to send you the free lessons. So just email the church at parishadmin at stdavidchurch.org and you can journey with us. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will illumine our minds and hearts to understand your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so open your Bibles to Job chapter 27. Here in this chapter, Job once again reaffirms his righteousness with an oath. He says, as surely as God lives, and he repeats his charge, God has denied me justice. Now, Job has asked God to declare the charges against him, but the heavens have been silent. He has called for an umpire to bring him and God together, but no umpire has been provided. So Job declares he will defend himself. Verse 4, he says, but he will utter no deceit, which means he will not confess to sins that he didn't commit as his friends urged him to do. Well, in verse 7, you see in Job's eyes, the three friends have acted like opponents, not friends. And to him, they seem godless, not righteous. And so, can you believe that Job calls for God's judgment to be unleashed on them for all the wrong they have done to him? Since the three friends had warned Job about the terrible destiny of the wicked, Job throws their words right back at them. He paints dreadful scenes of the judgment awaiting the wicked. He says things like the wicked will suffer the loss of their children by sword or plague. Widows won't weep because they see the deaths of their husbands as acts of divine justice. And the list of terrors goes on and on. Why does he do this? Job is warning his friends that the wicked, meaning them, are headed for destruction if they continue their personal attack on him. So next, in chapter 28, Job is weary of the so-called wisdom his three friends are giving him. So he asks, where can wisdom be found? And he gives three answers. You cannot mine wisdom. You cannot buy wisdom. Wisdom only comes from God. So Job draws a comparison between mining for precious gems and mining for wisdom. Men can dig up treasures from the earth, but cannot mine the depths of God's wisdom, something of far more value. Since God is the origin of wisdom, it can't be bought with a price. God chooses to impart it as a gift to his children. So Job declares in verse 28, the fear of the Lord, now that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. And can you remember that that was what God's exact description of Job was back in chapter 1, verse 8? God said he is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So in spite of what his friends say about him, Job is a man of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord means a loving reverence and awe for God. Well, in the next three chapters, Job will review his life and then challenge God to either vindicate him or judge him. So he says um, in chapter 29, he recalls the blessings of the past. In 30, he laments the sufferings of the present. And in 31, he challenges God to vindicate him in the future. So we've got past, present, and future going on here. And then the debate ends, and it ushers in two new participants, Elihu and God. So let's begin in chapter 28, where the first verse says, Job continued his discourse, which suggests to me that Job might have paused and waited for the third friend, Zophar, to take his turn to speak. But remember, Zophar is silent. And verse two, it is as if Job is speaking with a deep sigh. Oh, I would love to know days like that again, when God and I walked and talked together. He's relishing the memory of days gone by. He recalls the blessings he and his family had enjoyed prior to the crisis. He says, how I long for the months gone by. And see, there's a clue that his suffering has been going on for months he longs for the days when God watched over him with devoted care. But I love that in verse four, Job mentions as his number one joy, the intimate presence of God in his home when the Almighty was still with me. You know, Job has lost everything, and yet it appears that the blessing he misses most is his deep friendship with the Lord. 
Second, Job remembers the joy of receiving respect from others. Everybody used to recognize him as a man of integrity. He was respected by young, old, rich, poor. In verse 12, he remembers his ministry to others. He was a compassionate man who brought help to many. Job worked for justice, provided for the needy, defended strangers. In 18, his fourth joy was confidence in the future. That's gone now. He believed that he would stay healthy and live to an old age and die in peace. And his final joy in verse 21 was the privilege of speaking words of encouragement and love to others. His counsel was respected and appreciated by his community. Well, next in chapter 30, in verse 1, you can almost hear Job groan his words, but now. That was then, and this is now, and everything has changed. In his lament, Job catalogs the pains he is suffering. From the heights of public respect, Job has now tumbled so low that those who have been expelled from society for common good find themselves superior to him and laugh. He describes the humiliation he suffers at their hands. They spit in his face. The younger sons of these banished fathers mock him. Job has become their amusement, and they make life miserable for him. He says in verse 11, they throw off restraint in my presence. These troublemakers no longer fear the protective power of God over Job. Job describes the attack of his enemies as a ruthless army, building siege ramps, laying traps, breaking down his defenses, and no one restrains them. Even God fails to act on Job's behalf. And so Job says the terrors overwhelm me. Day and night, anguish never leaves me. He feels disgrace and humiliation. So then in verse 20, Job says to God, I stand up, but you merely look at me. Job knows that God is aware of his plight, but God's silence was Job's greatest source of pain. He feels God is attacking him ruthlessly. Job says, surely no one lays a hand on a broken man or kicks a person when he's down. And when a broken man cries for help in his distress, others have the decency to come to his aid. But the benevolence that I once extended to the needy is not reciprocated and nobody helps me. Socially isolated, Job says he finds himself in the company of jackals and owls. Verse 31 is a funeral dirge. Job's harp and flute are tuned to a minor key. And so chapter 31 is Job's last speech. He's doing What he's doing here is offering an affidavit, affirming his innocence and integrity, using a series of oaths that come out like this. They are if-then clauses. Verse 1, he began with a statement of his moral purity. He had been careful because he knew God was watching his every move. He had been honest in his business dealings. He'd been faithful to his wife, fair to his workers, compassionately ministered to the poor, generous in providing for the needy. He had always put his trust in God, not in his wealth. He'd never dabbled in idol worship. He had not rejoiced at the ruin of his enemies or called down curses. He showed hospitality to strangers. He had exercised careful stewardship over his land and tenants. Really, Job is inviting investigation into all of his dealings. And if God finds him guilty of any sin, Job willingly accepts the consequences. He feels his innocence does not warrant such suffering. In verse 35, Job asks God, whom he calls my accuser, to give him three things a hearing, an answer to his charges, and a document to prove his innocence. The words, let the Almighty answer me, functions as a subpoena for God to appear in court. Job expects God's testimony to exonerate him, but he wants a public document. He says, so I can wear it on my shoulder or put it on like a crown. Then Job's reputation will be restored and he can approach God like a prince, he said. So Job has challenged God either to vindicate him or pass sentence on him. Job ends with a flourish at verse 35, behold my signature, but Job doesn't actually get to speak the last word, God does. However, for now, God is silent. He operates on a divine schedule and will not be provoked into providing an explanation for Job until he determines the time is right. 
When Job's speech is done, everyone sits in silence. They are all talked out. The friends are appalled that Job has dared to speak so boldly to God, and they wonder, will God send lightning bolts from heaven as immediate judgment? Will the divine voice speak in wrath? Will God accept Job's challenge and appear to him and give Job an opportunity to defend himself? And maybe we find ourselves hoping that God might finally speak, but God is silent. And this was a lesson to Job that God is not at the beck and call of his creatures. God doesn't appear just because somebody thinks it's time for a showdown. And we, yes, we are getting weary of the long speeches. And so maybe it's disappointing when a fourth friend shows up and delivers six more chapters of speeches. I know you're nodding your head. But Elihu is a good man. And if you've ever been to a concert, you know there is always a warm-up act before the headline artist takes the stage. That's how we're meant to view the speeches of Elihu. He claims to speak for God. And the Lord doesn't rebuke him next week, along with Job's other friends for talking wrongly about him. Elihu's speeches are full of truth, which prepare us to hear the final speeches from the Lord. And I think Elihu's chapters give us a space between Job and God. They show that God is not forced into a quick, quick reply by Job's demands. God's going to act in his own time. Thus, Elihu's speeches delay the coming of God, and they emphasize God's freedom to appear or not. The delay adds to the drama. Job has thrown down the gauntlet, so to speak, and yet God does not show up. And I enjoyed studying what the commentaries had to say about Elihu. There were very diverse opinions about him. Some view him as angry, young, full of his own importance, a little pompous, a little long-winded, and he can be quite harsh toward Job. Yet Elihu proves to be the wisest of Job's friends. The trio are many years his senior, but Elihu's God-given understanding makes his counsel much better than theirs. You see, Elihu looks to God, not to man or to experience or to tradition like the friends did for understanding Job's plight. And instead of trying to prove that Job is guilty of unconfessed sin, he shows this. Job has a wrong view of God. Elihu doesn't want to argue morality as much as the others have done. His intention is to defend God's justice and sovereignty, and he's not nearly as concerned with how Job has ended up in his predicament. Yes, Elihu blusters away, and yes, he does make some mistakes, but in the middle of his blusterings, he speaks some gems, and these gems are important preparation for Job to be ready to hear from the Lord. Elihu explains the character of God very simply. A child could get this. God is gracious, God is just, meaning fair, and God is great. Elihu introduces a new truth that sometimes, not always, but sometimes God sends suffering not to punish us for our sins, but to keep us from sinning, to correct and restore us, to keep us on the right path, to help us grow spiritually. And Elihu is going to point out a vital flaw in Job. Job has grown prideful and arrogant as he challenges God to appear before him. So let's look at chapter 32. And Elihu is a man so unknown that his full pedigree has to be given in verse 2 so people can identify him. Verse 2 also says that Elihu burned with anger against Job and his friends. He's angry at Job for justifying himself and for his pride and for his wrong view of God. Elihu is equally disturbed at the three friends for not refuting Job. They have condemned him but not corrected him. Elihu thinks he will succeed where they have failed. He will supply Job with the truth. Well, in verse 4, Elihu has waited patiently, listening to his elders' debate. Finally, Elihu can't take it any longer. He is like a ticking time bomb, ready to explode and release his anger. Elihu admits to being reluctant to speak. He respected their seniority until he saw how little wisdom their many years had given them. Now he announces that he has new answers to give, and his insight comes from God, not from length of years. He claims his words are inspired by God and spoken by compulsion. 
Verse 10, therefore I say, listen to me. Having listened patiently, Elihu desires to be given the same courtesy that he's extended to the friends in Job. The fact that Elihu quotes from their speeches indicates that he has listened carefully. And I love that Elihu mentions Job by name nine times, something that remarkably the other three friends never did once. Elihu claims that God has filled him so powerfully with his spirit that he feels like wine corked up in a bottle. Elihu declares he will speak nothing but the truth. He believes that the wrath of God will destroy him if he uses flattery. So here he goes in chapter 33. Elihu says, Job, see there he's using the name, Job, listen to my words. Elihu stresses the validity of his message. It proceeds from an upright heart and is sincere, he says. He says his words carry God's authority. Well, this is an attempt to legitimize his insights. He might be a little proud of that, but he still is on point. He says, answer me if you can. Prepare yourself and confront me, although I think Elihu doesn't think Job's going to be able to. He says in verse uh, 8, Elihu, Elihu quotes what Job had earlier said about himself, and this is to show Job where Job is wrong. Now, in verse 9, Job never claimed to be sinless, but nevertheless, a self-righteous attitude has developed within Job's heart. In 10, Elihu captures Job's essential complaint. God has found fault with me, and God considers me as enemy. So Elihu begins his critique in verse 12. But I tell you, in this you are not right, for God is greater than man. Job anticipates vindication, but Elihu pronounces a verdict of guilty. Elihu reasons that Job, when compared with God's perfect holiness, is certainly sinful. Job's railings against God arising from his soured spirit are not right. Job and God are not equals. So in verse 13, he says, why do you complain to him? Elihu wants to correct Job's habit of fault finding with God. In 14, Elihu says, oh, God does speak now one way or another, though man may not perceive it. So while Job feels that God is silent, Elihu argues that God has been speaking and has been doing so loud and clear. The problem is Job's not been listening. Elihu presents three ways that God speaks. In verse 15, the first way God speaks is through dreams and visions of the night to provide a preemptive warning. He says, God may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings. Terror is God's discipline to bring man back to the right path. The purpose is to turn man from wrongdoing, he says, to restrain him from sin, specifically pride. And this restraint will preserve his soul from the pit or the grave. In 19, he says, secondly, God might speak through pain and suffering to teach us and warn us and humble us and bring us into submission to his will. Our, soft, our sufferings often prove to be our greatest teacher. In other words, sufferings may be preventative and not punitive. So let's talk about suffering. Suffering helps us focus on the right priorities. The more we hurt, the better we come to understand what really matters and what's precious. We gain wisdom. So suffering is not always an enemy. It seems strange to say that, but the truth is it can be a friend and we can reap benefits from it. When suffering knocks us flat on our backs, we begin to look up and we assume a vertical focus instead of a horizontal one. When we're hurting, we slow down and we, we begin to see our lives from God's point of view. Pain softens our heart. We notice things and people around us that we've been neglecting. We humbly recognize that our utter dependence on our Heavenly Father who loves us dearly. We choose to set our minds on the things of God, and we learn priceless lessons during the times of suffering. Trials can make you bitter or make you better. In verse 23, the third way God speaks, Elihu said that God, Elihu, this name's troubling me here, that God may also speak through the ministry of a special mediating angel. This is when the sinner is drawing near the grave and the messengers of death are about to capture him. Then he says a special messenger stands up, one among a thousand, so he's rare, and pleads his case. 
the messenger has a twofold ministry. He tells the sufferer what he ought to do, and he intercedes with God to have the person restored. Now, Elihu saw the angel not only as a mediator between God and man, but also as the provider of the ransom for sinners. For Christians, it seems likely that this interceding angel he's talking about is our Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator who gave his life as a ransom for sinners. Well, this is the heavenly mediator that Job has been asking for throughout the debate. Job wanted an umpire to bring him and God together for a trial. He wanted a heavenly witness to argue his case before God, and he wanted a redeemer who would vindicate him after his death. Elihu believes the result of this intercession will be effective, for he says Job will be renewed, restored, and joyful. In, in verse 27, Elihu coaches that Job should go to men and confess his sin of complaining against God. Job should say that he had perverted what was right in his charge against God. And then Job should gratefully declare, I did not get what I deserved. Job should testify to men that this messenger mediator had redeemed his soul from going down to the pit of death under God's discipline. And then Job would live to enjoy the light, for God had graciously spared him from the darkness of the pit. In 29, Elihu says, God does all these things to a man, both disciplining and delivering. God does it twice, even three times. Why? So that man will learn the lesson God wants him to learn. In 32, Elihu invites Job to respond to him. He declares that he's on Job's side and wants to see him vindicated in his claim of being righteous. His wisdom is intended to help Job. Well, in chapter 34, Elihu presents arguments to prove that God is just or fair. Now, this is a truth that Job needs to hear. Beginning in verse 10, he says, God is always true to his righteous character. A holy God cannot do evil. God is paying sinners back for what they do. God is sovereign, so he can't be judged by any court. Elihu reminds Job that he's not God's judge, so how dare the creature rise up to question the creator? In 18, he says, God can dethrone kings and remove nobles. God shows no partiality. He's omniscient and sees all things, so he executes perfect justice based on perfect knowledge. In 23, he says, God doesn't have to conduct an inquiry and gather evidence. He judges with perfect wisdom. He punishes the wicked. He rules over nations and individuals. And then in 31, Elihu urges Job, confess your sins and repent. Well, 33, verse 33 is interesting. Elihu gives Job a chance to reply, but Job says nothing. So probably viewing this as Job's stubbornness, Elihu gets furious again. And now he cries out a terrible accusation against Job. He says that Job lacks knowledge and insight, that he's rebellious and speaks proudly against God. Elihu concludes that Job needs even more testing. Perhaps that will bring him to his senses. He adds the charge of rebellion to Job, claiming that Job treats their advice with contempt. He scornfully claps his hands among us as if to silence us. Worse, Job has multiplied his words against God, meaning he has accused God of wrong. And for Elihu, this is unbearable. So in chapter 35, Elihu reminds Job that he has overheard him say a few things, such as, what do I gain by not sinning? Elihu argues that Job is acting as if his righteousness grants him some expectation of favor before God. Elihu responds by telling him to look up to heaven and imagine how far away God is. The point is that God's character is the same whether men obey him or disobey him. Then in verse 9, Elihu shifts to the perplexing mystery of unanswered prayer. He points out that man's pride causes God to turn away with a deaf ear. Elihu implies that Job's own cries are rooted in a prideful, demanding spirit and thus will not be heard by God. Elihu dismisses Job's complaint that he can't see God. Well, God does see Job and knows his case completely. God will not be hurried by Job's impatient demands, so Job must wait for him. Elihu insists that Job's pride and his empty words are what has caused God to be silent. 
Well, in chapter 36, Elihu offers Job hope by reminding him of the goodness of God. Elihu legitimizes his message once more as coming from God. And here are some of the good things he says God does. God is all powerful and all loving, working all things together for the benefit of his people. In verse eight, God tells people what they've done wrong so they can repent. He makes them listen to correction. God uses trials to gain man's attention. If people obey, God rewards their obedience and blesses them. And if they disobey, they perish in judgment. 13, the godless will not cry out to God for help because their stubborn hearts refuse to repent. But those who suffer, he delivers once they've learned their lesson. In 16, he said, God is wooing you with tender compassion to bring you back to himself. Elihu warns Job, don't long for the night of death in verse 20. Don't do that because you will avoid what God wants to teach you in your suffering. He goes on to say, who is a teacher like God? And then in verse 24, remember to extol his work. Really, he's tell, telling Job, remember to praise God. Well, in the last chapter, 37, Elihu wants Job to consider the greatness of God and the wonders of nature so that Job will realize how little he really knows about God. Elihu mentions God's control over lightning and thunder, rain, snow, wind, ice, clouds. He asks Job, can you explain these things? Can you control them? If not, then how do you think you can defend yourself before God? You can't even look up at the sun, and yet you want to meet God face to face. Elijah's conclusion, you can't understand God, so fear him. And speaking of weather, it is possible that while Elihu is talking, an actual storm is approaching in the distance. And when Elihu finishes these six long chapters, the storm breaks and God is in this storm. Oh, Job, now you will get what you are asking for, a personal meeting with God. Are you ready? So in conclusion, Elihu says some good things that Job needs to hear. He shifts the focus off Job's troubles and onto the sovereignty and majesty of God. He prepares Job for the questions God will ask him. Actually, it will be an interrogation next week. Elihu diagnoses Job's problem accurately. Job's actions may have been right, and he's not the sinner that his friends describe him to be but his attitude is wrong. Job is slowly moving toward a defiant, self-righteous attitude that is not appropriate. It is this attitude that God exposes when he appears to Job and questions him. Elihu performs a helpful ministry to Job. Sadly, Job does not accept it yet. Stay tuned. So let's read the summary sheet for these chapters. We will meet the fourth friend, Elihu. All right, Job has endured three rounds of intense debate with his three friends. The counselors will not abandon their theological position that Job has hidden sin, refuses to confess it, and so deserves his suffering. However, Job insists that he has lived uprightly before God and man. Job makes a final defense and scolds them for being so judgmental. In chapter 27, he says, my conscience is clear. Job swore by God's existence, and he swore by his integrity. May my enemies be exposed as wicked and without hope. I've taught you about God, so why do you still talk nonsense? This is how God treats the wicked. They will lose their children, wealth, house, and life. Where can wisdom be found? Job says God's wisdom cannot be sought. Man mines for precious metals with ingenious methods in unseen places. God's wisdom cannot be bought. Man cannot find wisdom and man cannot buy wisdom. God's wisdom comes only from him. God knows where wisdom dwells. He defines what wisdom is, and it is the fear of the Lord. Job remembers his past. Job's blessings. He had enjoyed God's protection, God's intimate friendship, and God's abundant provision. Job's fame, he had received respect from others and ministered to others. Job's future, he had expected to live to an old age and to enjoy a healthy life. Job's reputation, men once listened to him and learned from him. 
Job faces abuse. Young delinquents mock me. Scoundrels detest and taunt me publicly. My dignity and safety have vanished. My life ebbs away. The pain never stops. I am hurt and humiliated. God ignores me, torments me, and will kill me soon. I cry for help, and no one answers. I am alone. I suffer greatly. I love this chapter, but it might be a little prideful here. He says, I have taken an inventory of my life. I made a covenant with my eyes not to sin. Why doesn't God notice this? Examine my integrity. I have considered my devotion and invited God's discipline. I have evaluated my behavior. I know God will evaluate my actions. I have examined my ways and invited God's discipline. The fear of God has kept me from sin. I have examined my trust and considered the consequence. I've examined my dealings with enemies and strangers. I have nothing to hide. I have pleaded for a hearing. I've examined my land stewardship and I have invited God's discipline. So let's introduce Elihu here. Elihu speaks a new friend with a new message. Elihu is much younger than Job and his friends, which is why he's waited until now to speak. Unlike the terrible trio, Elihu states the sound advice that Job desperately needs to hear. The truthfulness of Elihu's words is later confirmed by the fact that Job's three friends are rebuked by God, but Elihu's words escape God's criticism. Elihu correctly explains the character of God. He affirms that God is gracious and caring, just and fair, great and sovereign. Elihu brings a new perspective to Job's suffering. Job's friends argue that Job needs to repent of sin that he surely had committed before his tragedies. Elihu remarks that Job needs to repent of pride that is developed during his suffering. In Elihu's opinion, Job's suffering have provoked an attitude of self-righteous pride before God as he questions God's ways and challenges God to appear in court to argue his case. Elihu's diagnosis cuts to the heart of the matter. Sinful attitudes of self-righteousness have indeed puffed up within Job that require his immediate consideration and personal repentance. So in chapter 32, Elihu informs Job that God is speaking through him, and thus Job should listen carefully. Elihu reveals new truth that prepares us to hear the final speech of God coming up. So Elihu is angry, and he says he's angry at Job for pitting his righteousness against God's and at the three friends for not finding an answer to Job's suffering nor proving Job wrong. He says, I think advanced years should teach knowledge, but now I know wisdom comes from God's spirit in a man. I have listened to your ineffective arguments, but now I am compelled to speak, and I will speak nothing but the truth. God is not silent. Job, pay attention to everything I say. I have heard your exact words. Job, you're wrong. Why do you complain to God? Job, God always answers one way or another. God speaks through dreams, pain and suffering, angelic messengers. Job, pray to God that you might see his face, be restored and testify of him. Listen to me, answer me, and learn from me. Divinely sent suffering can keep man from sin, pride, destruction, and early death. And God will always do right. Elihu says, my words should be listened to with discernment. Job, I heard you complain that God is unjust and that there is no profit in serving God. Job, I refute your words because God can do no wrong. God is sovereign over all the earth. God renders justice without partiality. God sees everything and can judge wisely. Job, confess your sins. I invite you to speak. But Job remains quiet, which infuriates Elihu and leads him to make a very harsh accusation. Job, you lack knowledge, you are a rebel, and you need even more testing. When God refuses to answer, well, Elihu repeats Job's claim that there's no advantage in being righteous. Elihu concludes that neither man's piety nor man's or his sin affect the character of God, but our obedience delights and our sins grieve the heart of God. Our sins and good works certainly impact ourselves and others around us. 
Men forget God until times of trouble. Because their hearts are proud and their prayers are insincere, God doesn't answer them. They want relief, not relationship. Job, you say you can't see God, but he can see you. The only thing for you to do is to wait for him to act in his own time. Job, you receive silence from God because you are demanding and impatient. Your heart is not right with God. Your situation will not be changed by your empty talk and many words. God is great. God is good. I feel like the table blessing the, the prayer there. And Elihu continues, I have more to say. My words are from God. God is mighty, executes justice, is attentive to the righteous, disciplines so man will repent responds to man's obedience or disobedience. He delivers sufferers once they have learned their lesson. God woos his people back to himself. Job, until you repent, you are under judgment. Don't let riches, death, or evil make you miss God's lesson. Job, rather than teach God, you should learn from him. Remember to praise God. Our great God is beyond understanding. God is still in control. Elihu wants to emphasize a message of hope that God is in charge. The same God who controls the storms of nature oversees the storms of life, especially Job's suffering. God unleashes his lightning, releases his thunder, commands the snow, controls the cold, creates ice, directs the clouds, suspends the clouds, spreads the skies. Job, you cannot approach God or comprehend God. You must be in awe of God. He regards the wise in heart. Therefore, Job, humbly repent of your pride and surrender to him. Put your trust in God who causes all things to work together for good. He is in total control of your life. Faith in him is more important than your desire for an explanation of your suffering. Finally, God will break his silence and speak to Job out of a storm in the next lesson. Job has been asking for his day in court to present his case against God. The creator has been charged with wrongdoing by one of his creatures and must defend his own honor. But the surprise is this. Rather than God taking the witness stand, God will place Job on the stand. <laughs> oh, it's interesting. So thank you for being with us. God bless you. See you next week.